This episode is brought to you by Ninja RMM, the easiest RMM you will ever use. Ninja offers easy-to-use remote monitoring and management tailored to your needs as an MSP or IT professional with a full range of features, all within a single pane of glass. Ninja is trusted by over 2,000 partners across the globe and was built to scale up as fast as your business requires. Visit ninjarmm.com forward slash tub talk to sign up to a free trial and become an IT ninja today. You're listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners with our featured conversation with Richard Tubb and Tiana wilson Buys of Talking Business. My name is Jeff Nicholson, and this podcast is all about helping you grow your IT business. In this episode, Richard talks with Tiana wilson Buys, business coach for creatives, author, and expert in time management and productivity. Tiana moved to the UK from South Africa to set up a business to help small business owners get stuff done. You'll hear about her proven referral harvester method, the challenges faced by business owners in the creative and IT sectors, and how to succeed at networking. This episode was recorded in person between Richard and Tiana at the Copthorne Hotel, Newcastle-Pontine. And now, without further ado, here's Richard Tubb talking with Tiana. Hi everyone, Richard Tubb here, and I'm here today with, well, a name that anybody in the Northeast will recognize. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I recently moved to the Northeast, to Newcastle-upon-Tyne in particular, and the lady I'm sat with today uh, is somebody who is very, very well known in the Northeast, somebody that I've been aware of and been a fan of her writing, of her podcast, of her blog posts for a long time now. I'm here with Tiana wilson Buys. How are you doing, Tiana? Um, very well today and so pleased to do this with you. It's my pleasure. Like I said, I've been a raving fan for a long time. So thanks for spending the time sitting down with me today. Oh, I think it's going to be so much fun. Um, you know, podcasts in itself is a passion of mine. I do listen to them and I used to host a few podcasts um, about a year ago or so. Yeah. Love podcasts. Well, let's, let's jump in straight there. So mm. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you um, first came to my attention um, with the podcast, The Entrepreneur's Power Hour. Mm. But for, for people who are perhaps not aware of your work, give people an idea of what you do, because there is a lot of things that you do. <laughs> well, I'm a business consultant, and I, I like to work particularly with creative industries um, and helping those creatives build and expand their businesses. That is my passion. Um, and I started certainly Entrepreneur's Power Hour podcast maybe with a little bit of a selfish inclination. For me, it was, um, I wanted to learn more. And a podcast was the ideal um, excuse <laughs> that I could use to get to speak to experts. So I would contact experts in the business world all over the world. Um, I don't know, sales experts, um, content marketing experts, whatever, because I wanted to learn from them. And I would say, hey, please, can I interview you for my podcast? And of course, they would say yes, and I would interview them. And I would learn from them. And then I have this wonderful bit of content that I can share with my audience so that they can learn. So for me, Entrepreneur's Power Hour was very much... Um, based on learning yeah. for me and for my audience. Um, and I just loved, loved, loved doing it. And I've interviewed so many really interesting people talking about life, uh, work-life balance, talking about business expansion, talking about marketing, all these aspects that small business owners come across all day long in their businesses. It was brilliant. Well, I'm glad you've uh, uh, fessed up to that, admitted that, because <laughs> you've just struck on the reason that I uh, put together my podcast. You know, I've been really blessed to, to speak to some of the smartest people in my chosen industry, the IT industry, um, and quite often I'd be sat having a conversation, sometimes over a glass of wine, other times not, <laughs> yes. and think, this is gold. I wish... Um, you know, that other people could listen into mm. this. Uh, that's exactly the point of the podcast. Mm. And I'll be upfront and honest. The reason mm. I invited you here today is, I think, not just uh, my listeners, but I can learn an awful lot from talking to you. So We can all learn from each other. That's the wonderful thing about business and life. You know, it's just opening yourself up and learning from others. That's how we can evolve as, as people. <laughs> 
Well, let's kick things off then. You're known as the Get Stuff Done Business Coach, a productivity guru. You're a speaker, uh, an author of a book, The Referral Harvester. We'll come to that shortly. You've also um, uh, got a property background. Mm -hmm. You've been a television personality. <laughs> I mean, wh where do we start talking? Let's start with uh, Get Stuff Done, mm -hmm. um, time management, productivity. Before we came on air here, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, challenges that business owners have. Uh, who do you uh, particularly work with in the creative industry and what sort of challenges might they have that, that perhaps would be familiar to, uh, to listeners of this podcast? You know, I think time management is possibly the biggest problem of every business owner out there, not only creatives, but it just so happens that I work mostly with creatives. Um, I think one of the big issues people have is that nobody has ever taught them how to prioritize so they've got all these millions of things floating across their desk and inbox and voicemails and things happening but they don't know how to prioritize so that's one of the big issues um, another big issue is that people don't plan properly mm -hmm. so they tend to just knee jerk all the time something happens a client phones the email drops in and they just react all the time instead of planning so it's very much um, life happening to them instead of them making life happen on their terms and at the end of the day you need to set the boundaries you need to set your terms you need to say this is how I'm going to work and stick to it um, and that is possibly the biggest issue and, and certainly with creatives which I work with a lot um, they're really good at what they do. They can design things, write things, whatever. And that is where all their mind energy goes to. The nitty gritty of doing accounts and running social media and all those other things that is part of business, they don't really want to find time for it. Yeah. So it drops right down the priority list it's outside Don't, their comfort zone, would you oh, say? completely, yeah. completely. It's not part of what they're interested in. I mean, how interesting is it to sit and do invoices? You know, <laughs> Well, unless you're an accountant. <laughs> unless you're an accountant. And even then, I'm... Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, but you've got to find a way to structure your, your tasks and your projects so that everything gets done also the boring stuff, but to make sure that you still have enough time for free thinking, for being creative, because that is what we all are, whether you see yourself as a, a, a creative and in a crea creative industry or not, we are all creative. Hey, we are building businesses. That is creative in itself. Um, but you've got to make time for all those other things as well. And it's just a matter of planning and structuring. Yeah, it's really interesting. I see a lot of parallels here. Um, the predominant audience uh, for me and for this podcast would be technology, IT business owners. One of the biggest challenges I see in the, uh, especially the small business IT industry is that these businesses are started by somebody who is a really, really strong technician. So fantastic at fixing computers, setting up networks, designing websites, whatever it might be. Um, they get good mm. at doing that. People naturally find them because mm. they're good. But then they've got a business mm -hmm. and they've got employees and they've got finance. And it's like, uh -huh. wow, I didn't sign up for any of this stuff. Yeah. It sounds to me as though that's that's a challenge across the board then. It's not yes. just uh, for the IT industry. Uh, oh, it, uh, definitely, definitely. I have worked with some IT uh, people before. One of the big things that I found in the IT industry, actually in many businesses, but particularly in the IT industry, is that they underestimate how long a task will take. Yeah. You know, a client will phone in and say, oh, just fix this little widget. They will then say, oh, yeah, it's a 10-minute job. But, of course, in IT, the wonderful world of IT, things go wrong, and it's not a 10-minute job. It's now a two-hour job. Um, and they then tend to, their day just flows away from them. Yeah. So time management becomes really difficult. Um because they underestimate how long things will take. And like we said, then all those things like doing invoices and doing the social media and the marketing, all of that then drops off the radar because they're really good. And that's where they, their passion is. And they think about, yeah, I want to fix this widget uh, or this bit of software or whatever. Um, and that's where they want to spend their time. Yeah. But underestimation, big problem. Interesting. So let's dig into this a little bit further. Um, practical advice 
for the technicians out there. Obviously in your industry it would be creative people from a variety. In my industry it would be uh, technicians, IT technicians and that. How do they make sure that all of these things, marketing, um, HR, finance, personal development, mm -hmm. leadership, how do they make sure that these things get done when they've got clients asking them mm -hmm. to get on and to do work yes. every day? Well, the thing is, you have to set the boundaries. If you don't set the boundaries, no one else will. It's really up to you to run your life. Um, personally, I'm a big believer in uh, time chunking. So I chunk my week into 10 blocks, the AM and PM of each working day. Um, and certain blocks are allocated to certain things. So for me, for instance, on a Wednesday, the entire two blocks of Wednesday, I don't do any client work. For me, that is ring-fenced business development work. Then I do my marketing, my blog writing, my social media, whatever I need to do to run my business. And you know what? It's If you do something like that, it's pretty quick that clients just accept it, that you are not available on that day. Um, we always think that we have to be available 24-7 for clients. That is a myth. Just set your boundaries and say, I will do client work, even if you're an IT person. Um, you can say, on Mondays the whole day I'll do client work, but Tuesday mornings I'll do client work, but maybe Tuesday afternoons I don't do client work. They can wait for Wednesday. And on that uh, Tuesday afternoon, you can do your marketing, you can do whatever else you need to do, your admin. But you need to look at your week and make chunks and just ring fence one or two chunks for business development and for all the other stuff, the admin. Um, and the rest of the time you can do client work. Yeah. It's perfectly fine. And it's interesting as well. I, I don't know whether you would agree with this, but most um, businesses that I speak to, when I when we talk about this technique of um, you know chunking stuff and making time for the importance, they say, oh, my client would never accept that. That's just an assumption, isn't it? Mm. What, what's been your experience when you've uh, challenged clients on these things? You know, I've never ever had a problem with that, with me personally, with clients not accepting me not being available. I mean, they just, they are all business people anyway, and they understand how life works. Um, if you set the boundaries, people respect it, by and large. I've never had a problem where a client was upset because um, I wasn't available on a Wednesday, for instance. Um, and with my clients that I have worked with, and they have set boundaries, their clients have, have been perfectly happy with it. Of course, nothing is set in stone. You know, if on a Wednesday, for instance, a client desperately needs to see me because there's a crisis, of course I'm going to do it. But it's just, this is my structure that I work in, and people absolutely respect your boundaries. So let's change tact a little bit. Um, for the smart listener, and there's a lot of smart listeners to this podcast, they will have worked out that maybe the accent they're hearing here is not a, a traditional Geordie accent. I'm going to resist the urge to do a Geordie accent. I'm newcomer to the area. Yeah, don't want to get don't thrown do out before I've uh, started. Don't we're, do Geordie. <laughs> <laughs> we're sat here at the uh, beautiful Copthorne Hotel. Uh, staff have been really uh, lovely to us. We're overlooking the River Tyne. Um, what brought you? from South Africa to Newcastle in the first place. And um, tell us a little bit more about the business that you do worldwide. Well, you might laugh and you might think that I'm, I'm making this up, but I actually moved to the Northeast. One of the reasons is the weather. It is cooler out here than in Africa. And I know people think I've lost my marbles. I haven't, I, I just, um, I do like the weather. Yeah, it's cooler, it's nicer. Um, so that's quite nice. But also I left South Africa for political reasons and for safety reasons. Um, there, there are some issues out there with uh, politics and, and personal safety. Um, and you know, you get to a point where at the time I was in my mid-30s or so, um, and I just thought, you know, I want to build a business. I want to build a good life for myself, and I felt I couldn't do it there. So I thought, all right, where can I go and add value to a community? Um, and the UK came up, and we moved to the UK, lived down south for a bit, um, and then um, moved up to Newcastle, just because it is a beautiful city. And here we are, and we absolutely love it here. But yes, I still don't speak Geordie. <laughs> 
I think that that's, uh, that's possibly the key to living here. I've already tried the Geordie accents after a couple of no. glasses of wine. No. It's not something that uh, uh, endears me uh, to the people around here, so no. I think I'll stick to the Brummie, yeah, stick to the to Brummie town. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned um, uh, other businesses that you work with, uh, predominantly in the northeast, but they've got reach um, uh, pretty much worldwide. Mm-hmm. What type of people uh, do you work with them? Um, like I said, a lot of creatives, but mm-hmm. not exclusively so. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them are video or film producers. I have uh, graphic designers. I have writers. I have copywriters. Um, I have quite a few consultants. Um, could be sales consultants or HR consultants, that type of thing. So it's a little bit outside of, of uh, the creative industries. Um, but a lot of them work uh, either nationally or internationally. Um, just because certainly with creative industries you're not really bound geographically these days I mean a copywriter you can do work for clients anywhere in the world which is wonderful Um, with technology advancing over the last 20 years or so I think it it is the age of the global small business and why not you know go out and and get clients anywhere else in the world it's um, it's certainly something that I work with my clients a lot is international expansion yeah um, because we can and it's wonderful just to have clients all over the world it's so much interest, more interesting personally I have um, several clients outside of, of the northeast as well uh, a few international and it's the only thing that bugs me is those wild time zones you know sometimes I have to have a meeting with somebody in Australia and on the same day have a meeting with somebody in Canada and it's just a little bit wide yeah yeah <laughs> As I alluded to right at the uh, top of our, our conversation here, I was aware of your work well before I moved up to the northeast of England. Um, you've got a fantastic presence online. And in fact, since I've moved up uh, here, I'm, let me uh, outright ask the question Is there anybody in the northeast that you don't know? Because everybody <laughs> seems to know you and speak so highly of your work. Oh, that's very flattering. <laughs> um, you know, for me, I just love meeting people. Um, and I, I make it my business to go out and meet business people and employees um, across the Northeast and outside the Northeast just because I really honestly love meeting people. And if I can help people by putting them in touch with somebody else in my network, I do so because for me, um, it's very much a, a giver's gain kind of mentality you know if I can put you in touch with somebody else and it's going to be mutually beneficial for the two of you why not so I definitely use my network in that way to put people in touch and help everybody along that's what it's all about that's what networking is all about Um, whether you do it face to face or online just be a good networker that is certainly my passion it's just connecting with people why not yeah so let's dig a little bit further into that so a lot of the listeners to this podcast uh, IT business owners are very similar in uh, respect to me I'm a former MSP owner myself the idea of walking into a room full of strangers (laughs) and selling to them and finding customers and all that sort of thing you know just fills fills me full of dread and I know I'm not alone in that Um, you wrote the book Referral Harvester which talks about um, effective business networking um, finding referrals being recommended into other businesses for anybody listening to this podcast who knows they should be doing more networking but isn't at the moment where would they start networking can be terrifying and frightening I know when I just arrived in the UK bearing in mind that I had zero network in the UK I had to go networking and I was shaking I was absolutely you know you feel like all eyes on on you and that kind of thing. What I have learned is when I walk into networking where I've never been before and don't know anybody, which doesn't happen to me very often these days, but... um, (laughs) Because everybody knows. (laughs) (laughs) I'll walk into the room and I'll scan the room and just look for one friendly face. Just one friendly face. Whether I know this person very well or not is irrelevant. If I just... If I've met him or seen him somewhere, I zone in on that person and just, hi, how are you? Start chatting to that person. That person is usually in a little circle of other people. You then automatically get introduced to them and off you go. So it's just finding one friendly face. That's always a good start. If there are no friendly faces, go straight to the coffee. 
It's <laughs> always good. And take your time making yourself a cup of coffee. Somebody else will come to the coffee table and start chatting to you. It's So it's either friendly face or coffee. Those are my two fail-safe <laughs> methods to get into networking. But actually, um, to pick up on what you said earlier, networking is not about selling, ever. I have never gone to networking with the intention of selling. I just don't. For me, it's all about relationship building. Um, it's, like I said earlier as well, be a good networker. Go out there with the intention of meeting new people and seeing who you can help. Who can you put in touch with somebody else and build those relationships? And the sales will happen automatically. Um, if you're a good networker and if you run a good old referral harvester, it will happen, but it all comes down to relationship building. Um, that's how I've built my business always. Right now, 89.7% uh, of all new business coming into my business um, is due to referrals. Yeah. Um, and that's all due to relationship building. My view, personal view towards networking changed radically um, when I sort of flipped it on its head uh, and started attending networking events uh, as you said, mm -hmm. instead of going there to look to sell to people, to go, okay, look, I'm fed up of mm -hmm. trawling the room, mm -hmm. saying, oh, you're not a good fit as a client, you're not a good fit as a client, and just getting bored with it. Instead, I went to those events and thought, you know what? I'm going to talk to people, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep my ears open, and I'm going to actually listen to what they say mm -hmm. and then I'm going to try and connect people I'm going to see how I can add value and and for me it you know really flipped things on its head and really changed and the amount of referrals that came in after that was was crazy I think it's human nature isn't it yes. to reciprocate of course yeah. that's one of the cornerstones of my referral harvester system is that human nature is to reciprocate our parents taught us when we were little teeny weeny kids that if somebody somebody gave you something you say thank you and you it's almost instilling a sense of obligation to that person it's human nature we are hardwired to do this why not leverage that that human nature to get more referrals um, in a good way of course you never abuse people that's not right it's all about relationship building and if you are nice to other people you give referrals you put them in touch you give them information whatever it's all part of relationship building. But what I find with people in general with regards to getting referrals, it's almost random. Hmm. They sort of, referrals just happen. They don't do it. And this is what we said earlier. People are reactional. They yeah. just react. Oh, a referral came in. Okay. Me, I like to be proactive, which is what the referral harvester system is all about. It's a proactive system that you can implement to get referrals. Um, and it's really just a, a system to help you build those relationships with key people, with your A-listers, identifying your A-listers and building those relationships. And then it's almost like referrals come in on a conveyor belt system into yeah. your business. But you have to be proactive, like everything else in business, you know. Mm -hmm. So apart from going out and picking up your book, The Referral mm -hmm. Harvester, tomorrow, what is the one action that you would say to anybody who has been perhaps procrastinating mm -hmm. about networking uh, and referrals in general? Mm -hmm. What's the one thing they could go away and do immediately after listening to this podcast to make life easier and better for themselves? Probably the first thing, if you want to go out networking and building those relationships, is go and identify some networking event near you right now. Go and find one and then sit down. And this is for people who are new to networking and old hands. Just sit and think, why am I going to this event? Get your why in your head straight first and sort of work out a primary goal and a secondary goal for each and every event. Um, and that goal should never be to sell. But work out why you're doing this. Be strategic about it. And then go and read the referral harvester, like you said. <laughs> Shameless plug. Just a um, no, subtle <laughs> plug. I think it was subtle. Um, and just learn how to build those relationships. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. Mm. And as well as uh, talking about business networking, you actually facilitate business mm. networking. So mm. I, I mentioned that we're at the, uh, the Copthorne, mm. right on the Quayside uh, River, on um, the River Tyne here. 
you run a business networking mm. event. Do you want to tell mm. people who perhaps in the Northeast to, um, where mm. they can learn more about that? Yeah, Mind Your Business Networking came about uh, about 18 months ago. I was in a networking group and you know when a networking group just fizzles out mm -hmm. and that's what happened there. And we had a core of maybe four members left who were really nice people and we enjoyed networking together but the organizer wasn't really that interested and it just fizzled out. So somehow I don't quite know how this happened. I decided, okay, I will take charge. Um, so I created Mind Your Business Networking and it just grew organically because the basis of it is relationship building. Yes, it's a members organization, um, but I've also made it so that it is cost effective because a lot of networking out there can be really expensive. Yeah. Um, so I've made it cost effective to make it available for more people. It's very much for small business owners. Um, and in the room, we never sell, but we do build relationships. But a lot of business happens in Mind Your Business um, amongst the members and guests, but also referrals. Because you get to know people, you meet them every second week, you really build a relationship over time. And it's all about um, getting to know somebody, liking them, trusting them, and then it's easy to give those referrals. Um, and that's what Mind Your Business Networking is all about. And yeah, if anybody is interested to, to join us, they can just drop me an email and I'll be more than happy to invite them along. It'll be brilliant. We love meeting new people. Cool. <laughs> um, and we'll make sure that all of Tiana's details are in the show notes uh, for, for this as well. So, But Mind Your Business Networking every second Tuesday at the every Copthorne on indeed. the Quayside in newcastle Barn time. So. Mm. So let's rewind a little bit. Um, we were talking about books. I'm intrigued. I know from other conversations with you that you're a book reader, a voracious book reader, the same as me. Um, what's one of the latest books that you've read that really made an impact on you? I do tend to reread books from time to time because I feel as we as humans and as business people evolve, we can learn more. Um, so I've just actually finished uh, Eat That Frog, which is a Brian Tracy book. Mm. Um, that's brilliant. I Just before that, I read a book called Do It Tomorrow, which I really loved. It really resonated with, uh, with how I work. It's very much about not being reactional. Um, when something comes in, don't do it today, schedule it for tomorrow or another day. Um, and I really love that. Uh, the author now slipped my mind, but it's really brilliant. Um, yeah. Do it tomorrow, brilliant book. And then the next book that I've just plucked out of my uh, bookshelf that I've uh, read before and am rereading now is called The Winner's Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's very much about mindset and because it is so important as business owners to have the right mindset for expansion, but also to understand ourselves as humans. Who are you as, as a person? Not only as a business person, but as a person. And because all of that impacts on, on your business. And I think a little bit of self-discovery from time to time is a really good thing. And uh, the Winner's Bible is really good for that. So I'm just about to reread it. <laughs> so let's talk about the winner's mindset for a minute and let's talk specifically, uh, you know, eat my frog um, or eat that frog, um, uh, putting things off. What does a typical day look like for you? How do you set yourself up for success each and every day? For me, planning is my the cornerstone of what I do. So on a Friday afternoon, I have two hours scheduled always to do my planning for next week. Um, and I literally plan my entire week with all my meetings goes in first um, and then I look at what projects am I working on um, and I schedule them and like I said earlier you have to estimate or try and estimate how long will a task take you and then schedule in enough for the day but what people do is they write a to-do list and a to-do list can be 77 gazillion miles long <laughs> <laughs> and you'll just never, ever finish it. Now, for me, I work on a, a will-do list, which is a closed list. So if it's on the list and the day starts, like on Monday morning, I come in, I know what's on my list. That is what I do. Nothing else gets added to that list unless it's an absolute emergency. Um, I also only schedule in 75% um, of my time for the day because life happens. Yeah, you have um, a buffer. You, you do. I mean... Anything can happen. You could underestimate a task, so that can throw out your time management. A client might contact you and it might be a crisis. Um, 
or you might be ill or, you know, things happen. So I schedule in 75% of my time. The other 25% I leave open for that buffer. And if the day goes well and life does not happen, it means I have 25% extra left over. So I've got two and a half hours. What do I do with two and a half hours? Mm, okay, I can start tomorrow's tasks or I can go and get my teeth into a project that I wanted to do or I can treat myself and go home. You know, it's whatever you want to do. If your stuff for the day is done, it's done. So for me, it's my typical day is absolutely scheduled always. My to-do list is there and I work through them. And I don't cherry pick because I don't have to. Everything on my list for today has to get done for today. The, the fact that I plan everything means that I get everything done. Because you've planned your whole week, you make sure that you do all the client work, all the marketing, all the accounts, all the admin, all the social media, everything, all the business development, it all fits in because you've planned it. Um, and that means that I can actually get absolutely everything done. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I have, for the longest time, kept a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of myself as a fairly productive mm -hmm. person. Um, but it was a revelation at the start of this year. It's my friend, the uh, the author, Chris Ducker, mm. said to me, um, if if it's scheduled, it'll happen. If it's yes. not scheduled, it's not going to happen. Quite right. That was a revelation mm. to me um, to actually, instead of putting things on this endless to-do list, to say, okay, when am I going to find the time to do it? Because, mm. uh, you know, another quote that I hear out there, you can do anything you want to do, but you can't do everything mm -hmm. that you want to do. So mm. adding to an endless to-do list is, mm. is not going to make uh, mm. uh, life happen. So the power of scheduling, really, really powerful. Quite quite right um, if it is scheduled it'll happen and I, I see too many people again particularly in the, the creative industries where they have a million ideas but you cannot do all million ideas in the same time so I work on on a waiting room system um, any idea that comes into my head I will write it down and it goes into my waiting room, which really is just a little drawer in my office, which says waiting room. And then once a month, I go into my waiting room, pluck all of them out and say, okay, I now have so much time in the next month to do a project. Which one of these crazy ideas now has the highest priority, will have the biggest impact? Which one am I um, interested in doing? And I never take on more than three projects at the same time and this is business development projects um, because you just can't cope with all of them so if I finish one I go to the waiting room and pluck one out but it is a good idea to just jot down your idea and put it somewhere in your waiting room because the other thing if you don't jot it down you forget that brilliant idea yeah or it rattles around in your head oh, yes. and you've got that nagging feeling oh, that yes. something I should be doing yeah. so I just have my my waiting room uh, and that's where I keep them at it really works quite well. Yeah. Mm. I, Evernote is my waiting room. Mm. Obviously, being a techie, being a mm. geek, I tend uh -huh. to use technology. But yeah, I tend to drop ideas yes. into Evernote, ideas for blog posts, yes. for podcast guests, for projects, yes. or everything. As long oh, as it's fantastic. out of your head and down on paper. That's quite the, right. Yeah. If you get it down on paper or onto your screen, yep. it gets out of your head, which means it clears your brain space to focus on whatever you need to do. Um, but if you leave it over there rattling around with the other zillion ideas, you actually just can't get anything done in your head. Um, yeah, you've got to get it, get it out, get it on paper. Or I know one of my clients like to do little audio files. So she'll speak her idea and she's got a whole folder full of these crazy things um, that she'll get to. That's where she keeps her waiting room. So hey-ho. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. But the, the advice there is get it out of your head and mm. uh, and uh, stop it rattling around there. <laughs> so we've talked about business success. Mm. You're very successful at everything you've turned your hand to. You help clients to be successful. What about the flip side of the coin? Mm. What about the mistakes you've mm. made? Would you care to share any, any mm. mistakes you've made and what you've learned from them? I think we learn much more from our mistakes, or let's call them failures, than our successes. Yes, success feels really good and makes us all warm and fuzzy inside. But I think where you really get street smarts is when you, when you hit a brick wall. Um, oh, I've made many, many mistakes in business over the years. Um, I would say my biggest mistake in the last 10 years was starting a business without doing any market research. Um, 
that was when we just arrived in the UK. I did not know the UK market at all. Um, each country is different. How business is conducted is different. Um, and we rocked up here. We thought, okay, brilliant, new place, London, lovely. Let's start a business. No market research. Spent thousands to set up a limited company, get a whole lot of training, all this wonderful stuff, and there was zero demand. <laughs> um, so we had a beautiful business with a lovely flashy logo and all this wonderful stuff and no, no clients. clients. <laughs> so that was a, quite a bit of a shock to the system. Um, so how do you do market research now? Before for me, you, as an entrepreneur, before you kick things off? You know, I, I love research. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so for me, if I want to start something new, and believe me, I do not want to start another business right now, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would really go and do a whole lot of surveys. And actually, I love Twitter. Twitter is the best place to do market research. So if I want to launch a new product or a service or a new package or whatever, I'll turn to Twitter and say, hey, guys, what do you think of this? And, you know, I've got, I don't know, 11 and a half thousand followers or so on Twitter. And a lot of them are really engaged. So they're perfectly happy to give me their input. Sometimes I'll go and create a, a survey on th something like SurveyMonkey. And I'll tweet that link out and I'll say, hey, guys, please, can you help me with this research? I'm thinking of offering X, Y, Z. What do you think? Would you need it? Do you know anybody that will need it? What would you pay for it? What would you like to see in this package? And you know what? If you tweet that out a few times and you're quite strategic about it, you very quickly get one, one and a half thousand replies. That gives you a very solid core of research and you can then work that data to decide which way to go. Go to Twitter. Perfect place. Well, you are the second smart and successful person who has recommended um, going directly to your audience mm. Um, mm. and asking um, mm. what it is they would want mm. um, in the first place. And it's something we uh, so often overlook. I've got a business venture that I'm thinking about kicking off at the moment. Um, I've gone by anecdotal mm -hmm. uh, evidence. Oh, yeah, it seems like a good idea and that. But the next thing I'm going to do mm. is go out to my audience and say, yes. what do you think about this? You know, they are out there. They follow you already they know you to some extent and most people are quite willing to give their input so why not ask them you've built up that audience you've given them value over time they'd be quite happy to help you go ask them Absolutely. and this, this doesn't just apply to um, obviously you and I have got big followings on mm. on Twitter uh, reasonably well known um, in the business community but there might be some you know somebody listening to this is a small IT mm. shop um, perhaps doesn't mm. engage in social media mm. um, and has got a handful of clients they mm. can still go out to their client oh, yes. base and ask advice can't they oh absolutely um, and I do that most definitely if I want to offer something new I often go to my A-listers um, and these are my close clients that I have worked with for quite some time I know them they know me and I have built up a level of trust with them that I can ask them for real feedback real input and they give it to me so just go and ask even if you've got three clients out there go buy them each a cup of coffee and ask them look I want to launch this what do you think they will be honest with you if you've built up that good trusting relationship with them. Your clients are fantastic. They are the lifeblood of your business in more than one way. They can give you all the input and feedback you want. They can feed you with referrals. They your clients are everything. Yeah, mm. and it's interesting actually going out to your clients and asking those questions. Um, it shows a little bit of vulnerability on mm. your part, and I find that it actually builds relationships it with does. clients. The clients think more of you mm. um, for actually asking their advice. Always. Everybody likes to be asked for advice, don't of they? Of course, yeah. of course. They feel that you trust them enough to ask them. Um, yes, and that just it builds those relationships. I've got really, really good, solid relationships with all my clients. And it's because I've act actively worked on it. And I do ask them for their advice. They know my business from a client's perspective. And they experience what I do for them and the value that I give to them. They are the best people to, yeah. to give you that feedback. Yeah. Mm. Well, Tiana, we're, we're approaching the end of our time now. Um, for anybody who's listening to this, wants to find out more about you, mm -hmm. uh, the book Referral Harvester, mm -hmm. um, uh, needs help getting stuff done, <laughs> anything that we've uh, talked about, how would they reach out to you? 
possibly the best way is on Twitter. I'm mm-hmm. at Talking Tiana. I love connecting with people, so I'm always on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn, I float about. Or, of course, you can go onto my website, which is talkingbusiness.biz, and just go and find me there. I think there might be a freebie available. There's usually a freebie available. There's a freebie available. Always. We love a freebie. Yeah, so. there's always a freebie available. <laughs> so, yeah, go drop by, say hello, and I, I love to talk to people. So do have a chat to me. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your time, Tiana. Mm-hmm. Just before we leave, is there anything that perhaps we haven't talked about or any one thing that you could say to people to take away and to start doing immediately today uh, to make their business and their life a better one? I think the, the first thing or the, the best thing they can do is decide what do they want out of their business? Where do they want to go with their business? And then decide on one thing that they can do that will further their business and do that one thing every single day until they've achieved it. Take one action towards your goal every single day and you will reach your goals. Tiana, fantastic advice. It's been my pleasure to sit down with you today. I really appreciate your time. Good luck with everything you're doing and um, we'll both work on our Geordie accents over the next few weeks. Oh, absolutely, yeah. (laughs) Thanks very much, Tiana. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners. You can find the show notes and bonus content for this interview, along with dozens of other interviews with IT business leaders over at www.tubblog.co.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, then we'd really appreciate you rating and reviewing the show over at iTunes. Every review helps us reach new listeners and helps raise the bar for success in the IT industry. Our next episode will be a bit different. Richard speaks with the members of Team Tub, the expert freelancers he works with to run and grow his successful IT consultancy. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak with you next episode. Have a great day. This episode is sponsored by Ninja RMM, the easiest RMM you will ever use. Ninja focuses on simplifying your life as an MSP or IT professional. Are you moving from a break-fix model to fully manage your assets? Have you already embraced the world of managed services and are looking to expand your portfolio? Well, Ninja's platform combines monitoring, alerting, antivirus patching and IT automation, providing your business with a single pane of glass for managing multiple devices across various environments. Visit ninjarmm.com forward slash tubtalk and become an IT ninja today and mention you are coming from tubtalk. Ninja will have a special offer ready for you. Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my diary of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.